Okay, well, we're looking at about three minutes after at this point, so we'll go ahead and get started and let folks join in as they come. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Sean Richardson. I am on the board of the uh, first organization, and I serve as the uh, chair to the six, excuse me, the liaison to the six. Um, my role is to help provide any support that the SIGs might need, uh, making sure that they have everything they need to be to be as effective and, and functional as possible. Uh, as many of you probably know, the SIGs are all volunteers. Uh, people joining in have ideas of things they can do to make the security landscape better and work together to create working groups, to funnel ideas, to create discussions, to come up with um, different uh, uh, learnings and teachings and education, uh, new uh, frameworks and how to do things a little bit better. And it's a really wonderful community. Um, I, my personal opinion is the, the SIGs are the reason for exist. If it wasn't for the work that the SIGs were doing, I'm not really sure what we'd be doing here today. Um, one of the great things that uh, we're gonna have happen today is the SIGs are gonna come and give, start giving updates on what they've accomplished over the last year. Uh, it's been virtual for all of us. Uh, no one's really had a chance to meet as you well know. So it's been wonderful to see people are still pushing forward and getting things done and uh, planning for the next year. One of the other things I do wanna point out is that the SIGs are looking for volunteers. Um, a lot of great ideas going on and they can use your help. Uh, even if you're kind of new to FIRST, this is a great way to kind of get in and start meeting people. Um, you can go out to the website and see what SIGs are out there um, or you can see who we're having today. Um, each of the SIGs is going to have a contact at the end of their slide. If for some reason you miss that, you can certainly email the first secretary uh, or you can email me, Sean, at first.org uh, and we will get you aligned with the proper folks to talk about joining and the kinds of participation that each SIG needs. One of the other things that we've been working on from the SIG perspective is getting our collateral updated. So making sure that the websites are all getting updated with here are all the new areas that the SIGs are working on and here are all the great accomplishments they've done and. Uh, kind of like little one-pagers, like the kind of work they're trying to get done and the kind of volunteer help they need. Uh, some SIGs need editors, some SIGs need people who want to come in and, you know, turn up ideas. Uh, some SIGs just kind of want to have open conversations about things. So we'll go into a little bit more what each SIG is looking for in their volunteers, but do feel free to, uh, to jump in and, and come join us. Uh, the more the merrier and, uh, as they used to say in sailing, many hands make light work. Um, again, this is all volunteer efforts. This is all things we do outside of our normal day job. And, and for most of us, that day job is also rather hectic if you're in security or incident response. Uh, so we encourage what participation you can, can give us and uh, look forward to, to working with you. Now we've got, uh, we're at uh, 7.06. Um, we still got a couple more folks joining. Um, so Pete and Josh, we'll, we'll give it a few more minutes if that's all right. And then we'll get started with, uh, with your uh, update. Sounds fantastic. Terrific, thank you all very much. <clears throat> and again, for those who are just joining us, we are gonna be using the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screen. So just click on that. If you have a question, type it in. And then I will be reading those out for Chris and Josh or whoever later on in the day uh, to, to answer. Okay, we still have a couple more people joining. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're gonna get started here. Um, 
we have Pete Alor and Josh Dumpling from the PSERT Special Interest Group. And they're gonna give us a little update on all the amazing work that uh, the PSERT SIG has been doing. Um, I have to admit, I have a, a near and dear to my heart as I am a PSERT person. So I'm always amazed at, uh, at the work this group is doing and they've actually utilized uh, much of the work that they've done, the, uh, the framework and uh, the, the waiting of that framework and uh, wait anxiously for the next updates. Uh, so with that, gentlemen, I will give you the floor and thank you. Thank you, Sean, really appreciate that. And welcome to everyone who's attending today and those who are gonna watch the recording of this as FIRST does its 2021 updates. Today, Josh Demling and I, the co-chairs for the PSERT SIG, or the Product Security Instant Response Team, we'll talk about the efforts that we are doing inside of our special interest group. So we are seeking a lot of help. We've done a lot of great things and we feel like we're on this journey that uh, we continue to grow and learn from. So today we're gonna cover a couple things, really just to give you a highlight of who we are, a little bit of our history. And then we'll talk a little bit of what is our future? And then of course a call to action. And we'll try to do this in a way that jam packs everything into these three items. So bear with us as we go through. And Josh and I will in fact be handing back and forth. And uh, you have to realize we've been cohorts in crime for a long time. I forgot to mention that Josh is over at Intel Corporation and he's a senior director of their PCERT and a few other things. I'm at Red Hat and uh, we, uh, I'm the director for our PCERT over here. So you see a lot of interaction between us and it's just something that we in the PCER community seem to do a lot of. So first, our history. The interesting part is that uh, when I was with the first board of directors, we worked on a CSERT services framework. Yes, computer security instant response team. And as we went through that, we started saying, well, you know, this, this should apply for the entire first community. What a great deal. And then we start looking at uh, what it is that a PSERT does, and we came to realization that, wait a minute, we use a lot of similar terms, but we have different functions. And that begat the uh, PSERT SIG uh, we formed almost eight years ago. I, I can't believe it's been eight years run already. But we came up with the idea of a PSERT services framework. And the whole impetus behind that was, how do we have a common body of knowledge? We recognized a couple of things. First of all, we were all working independently, but there seemed to be consensus that there's a group of us who were doing very similar functions and we ought to go ahead and outline them. Second part is we realized that as we worked through that, a lot of other people didn't know what it is that we do and that it was in fact specialized. That included other P-certs who were brand new to national C-certs, to governmental uh, regulators and other uh, bodies and industry groups. So we thought, why don't we just build this community of knowledge from the practitioner perspective? So over time, we've grown. Uh, at our last TC, we, we called it a hybrid TC, a technical colloquia for those who wonder what a TC is. We actually met face-to-face, -face, the vast majority of us, in March of 2020. In fact, for most of us, that was the last trip we were on. A couple companies actually had refrained from traveling due to uh, COVID. So we actually made a hybrid and we were the first TC to try that where we actually live streamed what was going on and had people participate. And with that, we had over 100 people from 44 companies at the TC. Now, this is three days of organization of going back and forth, putting together a program and a lot of communication. And we're sharing specifically what we do. So we look to continue that, and we're looking at how we're going to host one is still in 2021. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> It'll be late in the year, not too late. What do we do? Well, in 2017, we actually issued the first P-Search Services Framework. And I tell you, as soon as we got that out and we got into people's hands, we realized we'd forgotten a lot of things. <laughs> and so we did an immediate almost uh, revision of our document. And we came to the expectation as we published that, that we will have to do iterations. Because as we write this, as Sean pointed out, we have a tendency to consume our own writings. There's just enough movement around the community that we realize as we move to another organization, oh, we should have continued writing this. We should have done that. I could have used this. 
And the interesting part we're finding is people are contributing what they learn and putting it in as they experience it. And that's where we're growing our documentation from. But we're reinforcing it from a perspective of if you're new or if you're very mature, what is it that happens? So we're going to talk a little bit about, we have a couple levels of documents. I think Josh is going to cover that in a little bit later. But we realized just doing it for ourselves wasn't enough. So we started looking at how do we get the information out? And so we put together uh, in 2018, our first set of training videos, which were really off of our version 1.0 documentation. And we had a lot of fun doing it, believe me. Uh, it, we, we had a great time. We learned a lot. Uh, we're all not natural speakers on camera. And so we have good bloopers if you really want to see good fun things. But we really were talking from our heart about what it is that we do with firsthand knowledge of writing the document and experiencing it. And that in turn led us to write a maturity guide. And our first maturity guide was pretty good about saying, here's what we think you ought to be able to do and how, when you look at the framework. Having said that, we're not finished with that yet. So why are we here? Well, yeah, we like putting together documentation. Not really, you know, like everyone else writing, it can be sometimes a bit of a, a chore, but we do it because of one, we have passion but we're really learning that as we do this, we're exchanging a lot of information. We are exchanging, what are we doing right now? So it's not unusual for us to kind of do a sidebar within a meeting and talk about a particular problem and find that we all experience it in, in various ways and we have suggestions that may help in the current situation or broadly. So we try to work through that. Now we've come to the realization as we start looking at things that we need to change a little bit about what we do between our technical colloquia and what we do in a conference. And our technical colloquia is really focused about what are we doing right now and what do we need to do next and what are our state of the art? How do we develop it? And we want to focus now on conferences about what do we inform everyone about what we've accomplished and what they can use. So one is informational and how do you learn this process? How do you become part of the community? How does this work? The other one is, how do we design it? And how do we construct it? And how do we make it work easier, better, and quicker for someone who's joining the community or is moving to another job and they're trying to upgrade the maturity of their new organization? So that's a framework of where we were to where we are. So let's talk about who we, what we do. And Josh, I think you're on. Oh, who's got, there we go. Who's got control of the slides? Okay. <laughs> so our, our goals and deliverables, um, these have evolved over time because um, as Pete pointed out, you know, every time we meet, we realize that there are things that we uh, could do or, or think deliverables that we could add to our bucket list that would help shape the industry. And we are a collaborative group of unique individuals that works together to um, uh, find all the, the, the missing gaps and the holes that we have in our processes and make them better. And we all learn from each other. So the, our primary goal is to foster the collaboration between the P-certs across these different organizations. And to each point, you know, we have had a lot of different industry groups that have come together to um, share knowledge and exchange ideas on uh, the nuances of dealing with product security vulnerabilities within their own ecosystems. And a lot of times we find there's a crossover, there's commonality between those techniques. And we try to find opportunities to share that information, right? And in some cases, this is really an opportunity for us to vent about our frustrations as well. And the other part was developing and sharing this common body of knowledge and best practices. Sometimes this comes in the form of, you know, the written word. We put it down on paper in the case of the framework, but we also put this uh, into our wiki that we have, and we exchange these ideas uh, sometimes very passionately in our technical colloquiums. Um, so that's that is probably one of the biggest opportunities for the P cert, the members of the P cert community at large, to collaborate and share these ideas. Um, the things that we want to focus on as well is creating more education around this topic. PCERT is a unique uh, area of, of expertise and skill that, um, and, and we find that there's a real shortage of people with our knowledge. 
So we want to be able to share that with others, right? Because we're not just a team that does that handles security vulnerabilities. I mean, the product security incident response team doesn't operate in a vacuum. We are an ecosystem and we depend on all of the other groups, C-certs, as well as our legal teams, our comms teams, our, um, our marketing teams, our engineering teams to work together with us to address the security vulnerabilities. So creating more education around what we do will help bridge those gaps a lot more. Um, the other thing is finding opportunities to inject knowledge about PCER into other conferences and colloquia. There's, um, we, there are we were finding more and more, there are people that are talking about PCERTs in conferences, or there's opportunities to talk about PCERTs, but we need to pull together a more cohesive list and actually have a little bit more aggressive uh, campaign to go out and uh, help set the stage for what PCERTs are and integrate us into those, those conferences, as well as the maturity of PCERTs uh, and creating a I think a, a path for most PCERTs to follow. This We've published a, a maturity guide, but we need to, to help uh, augment that with a maturity assessment. This is something that will give our teams, our PCERTs, an op, a way to, or at least a guideline for how to um, set expectations with their management and ma uh, monitor their progression and their maturing journey. Um, and we have a lot more material that goes along with this. I mean, we talked a little bit and we'll talk more, I think, as we go on about things like the framework and the maturity guide uh, and education, but there's a lot of uh, sometimes anecdotal information, sometimes it's uh, more context sensitive information that we wanna publish that talks about the operations of a piece cert and we need to get more of that out there. Um, and that's part of our goals and deliverables along the way. Pete? Turn it back Thank to you. Josh. So continue with some of that discussion that, that Josh has spoke to is we really believe that as we learn our stuff, we can't hold it to ourselves. This, this is the, the huge mistake in product security and response is if you hold it to yourself, you're missing something. Josh spoke to the internal coordination efforts. What we also talk to is the external. As we work through our issues and, and incidents, we find more and more that we have to talk to others inside the field of incident response at sometimes our, those who are upstream from us, sometimes they're downstream from us, sometimes they're a partner, sometimes they might even be a competitor. When it comes to security, it's about the ecosystem. The customer has an expectation that the right thing is done. And our purpose in life is to do the right thing in addressing a problem and fixing the ecosystem. So as we do that, we've been putting our, our topics together and publishing them on the first website. And we're looking, as Sean pointed to, some changes on the, on the website to make it easier to group all the stuff together. But we are publishing with a Creative Commons license. The, the issue here is we want this out. We want people talking from a common lexicon. We too often use different words for the same meaning, or we use the same word with different meanings. And that is such a confusing issue. And that was one of the reasons why we decided to start writing this out was to help with that terminology and understanding. So as we do that, we, we're trying to organize and then also uh, in a way that seems logical. And our largest problem was what to do first. We, we just don't have enough people to go and through and, and work this. So we're looking for some additional help. Believe it or not, your help could be as small as helping us edit the video. Um, you know, when Josh is a co-chair is editing videos, we, we, we're a little pressed for time. So if, if you have a specialty like that, feel free. If you have a passion for uh, recording and, and hosting, uh, we'll take it, okay? But we're really trying to organize also about what is that we talk to within the entire supply chain. You know, people are talking to us about supply chain. It's an important part. We're an integral part of how that supply chain is secured and how we link to each other. And that is what we're trying to, to offer into there. And so when people start talking about, wow, geez, what's this a very level versus what is a CVSS score? You have to understand how we use those within both a piece or internally and between ourselves. And so we're trying to reach that. We're also trying to make sure that we focus on our audiences. I say that in the plural because while we are educating PCERTs, 
we're not only educating P certs. Yes, if you have a new P cert, there's something that you want to learn. Yes, if you're a mature P cert, there's something you can always learn from another one. But more importantly, we're trying to educate our key stakeholders in our management chain so that they understand what it is that we're accomplishing for the organization and that's like what others are doing. So they have a, a, a degree of understanding parity or how they want to advance something and move through or how others are doing it. So it's just not something that, you know, uh, some person made up and, and uh, we're not sure if that's the right thing to do. We're also trying to work with security engineers and, and inform actually researchers and finders because they're a key part of the ecosystem. They need to know what it is that we provide and why they want to link into us and not go simply straight off to an engineer. I'm not saying it's not, the engineer's not important, he's key. But for a lot of organizations, if we don't have it in coordination, we can't react as an organization. And so you'll hear us talk about orchestration event. And that's exactly what we do as an instant response team is we're orchestrating the response from across the entire organization to make sure we gave a complete response, that we address all the areas that that problem is at, and that we give a complete answer back to the finder and that we coordinate together. And so that's what we look to do. The information is really out of the piece or community. And while we are a first organization and first is, is our greater community and we publish to the first community, we will take P certs from anywhere. You do not have to be a first member to be part of the P cert SIG because the key element is that you are a P cert. You're doing product screening and response. You're part of our community. And we look for you to participate and learn or to contribute. That is important for us because we don't have all the answers. We're just trying to assemble them into a way that makes sense. And so as we go through that, we try to group what we do in a way that we can put it out. And so we've just gave it a priority level of high to low that this is a high priority issue to, to put together. And that is what the education team works on first and foremost. And then we try to work those through as we can best move forward and put together a good set of content. Josh. Yeah, and I, I think uh, I want to echo some of what Pete said here about the collaboration and uh, the need for uh, more people that want to participate in this community. Um, Pete and I got started um, in this and, and I think have continued to drive this mission because we have a passion for bringing the community together. Uh, th there are times when we get to share a lot of uh, share some tears and share some laughs with each other um, uh, as a community and we can commiserate on the challenges that we all face that are so common. And this is how I would say the SIG really started and operated for a long time. We would get together, we would talk about specific issues that we had, uh, share some information, share some knowledge, and we had these um, regular meetings. And we realized though that um, we were uh, we were running a little sequentially in all the things that we wanted to accomplish and that it was a challenge because there was, there was so much work that we knew we needed to deliver as a SIG that we knew would be valuable to the broader community that we realized at some point, if we just continued down the path of working one work item at a time, um, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't really be meeting, uh, I think, the spirit of what the rest of the community needed or wanted. Um, so we spent some time talking with the community. I mean, we had grown quite a bit too. I mean, we went from probably a very small group, Pete, I think, I can't remember exactly how many people we started with, but we've grown to, you know, hundreds of members. And I think that's, uh, there's a lot of people that have an interest and desire to learn more about this PSERT community, but also to have a hand in how we shape the rest of the industry. And, but again, if we continue to do things sequentially, we weren't going to be able to uh, meet the, I think, the demand that we had out there. So we started to think about how do we break ourselves up into different working groups um, and, uh, and have sub chairs within the PSERT SIG that would lead teams to focus on specific areas of interest. The framework, uh, a new revision of the framework uh, so we called it framework 2.0 and maturity document and all the supporting documentation, things that I talked about before, where we'd have more uh, uh, supportive topics that would 
augment the framework and the maturity documents. Uh, a PCERT tooling team, as well as a, a team that focused on education and a team that would work on trying to crack the nut of dealing with third party components within uh, the products that have security vulnerabilities. Um, these, this is how we started to break the team, the, uh, the SIG up. Uh, we have subgroups that are working and having separate meetings and report back to the bigger technical, uh, the bigger SIG. And we still though have a monthly meeting where we share and uh, exchange thoughts on different current events or topics that are affecting our industry and our line of work. Uh, now, Pete, I think you're going to take us through some of the these these SIGs in a little bit more detail, right? Yeah, I, I will, and, and I want to talk about what Josh talked about. We we realized that we could ask everyone to work all the time, mm. and we said, "Hey, we, we need to feed ourselves." We have a little uh, fun too, right? Yeah, because in 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 the, in the early part when we were just small group, it was very easy to commiserate about certain things. We found that when we did the uh, monthly um, informational type stuff, we 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 got a surge of like most of the SIG showing up and uh, we introduced topics. We, we've actually made it so that we, um, I won't say we provide uh, two posing comments, but we, we kind of grill ourselves to ask the question and get others to think. And in so doing, we've gotten some people who's like, oh, I didn't even know that was going on within uh, the, this standard that supports what we're doing. And oh, I, I didn't know they were trying to do that. We, we should talk more about this. And, you know, the stimulating of the thought and, and talking about certain events that we've all recently experienced are, are part of what we're trying to make sure we don't lose, as well as doing the work here. And uh, I'll go down to the next part. So, you know, the services framework, the, the, the interesting part is we, we, we actually have broke this down to three aspects, and, and it was kind of alluded to in the previous slide. The first aspect is well, we, we, we didn't put everything we need to in the services framework. Okay, great. What'd you forget? Well, we need to address cloud. Oh, we need to do a little bit more in, in industrial control systems, things of that nature. When you get to the maturity, what we've figured out is, okay, we gave a maturity, a way to help look at your maturity. Now we're trying to break that into two parts. One is here's a maturity overview. It's a quick down and dirty. And the second is here is a, nitty gritty, step-by-step, -step, working through all the different sub-functions and that that you would perform. Two different views, neither of which are advocated as the answer. They're tools for you to use and examples. The third set of documents that the services framework group is working on is, you know, we found a, a bunch of us when we moved from position to position within the industry that, uh, oh, the framework's good. It kind of tells a high level. Um, hey, where's the plan? I, I need it. I need an instance response plan. And we went, uh, we didn't write that, we forgot. So we're, we're trying to write that now and open source it so that as we write it, you can fall in on a plan that gives you a good overview of what you do. And then what are the elements that go underneath that? So there's just a lot of work that we're working there and expecting that services framework and we're aiming to complete all that by June of 2022. In other words, aiming for a conference in Dublin. Yeah, and sorry, Pete, I just want to add something to that about the services framework. There's the other thing that we did is we built out a schedule and a cadence. Uh, in the past, we've had a, um, I, I think we, we would set our goals around wanting to collect a bunch of information on certain topics and make sure we had certain updates in there. And it took however long it took. Uh, the challenge there was that um, people were waiting and, and, um, and hoping for an update to the document. We can never tell them when it was gonna come. So one of the things we set out to do as part of this uh, services framework group is to put together a schedule, a cadence that would outline a review schedule, uh, a collection of, of new work products and integration of those work products from month to month to month. And you know that would culminate in both dot releases of the document as well as a final release. So I think this has been a, 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 this establishing this has allowed us to create some consistency uh, for our audience, as well as a way for us all to integrate, uh, I think our, the, the work that we wanna get done into a time schedule that, um, that's, that's flexible, that's adaptable, 
right, to our, our own individual challenges around our schedules, as well as the needs of our, our constituents. So I, I just wanted to point that out, that we spent some time trying to create a way to be more consistent in the delivery of these documents, rather than it just being uh, ad hoc. So yeah, that's, that was a good point, Josh. And I've forgotten that, you know, that about the iterations to, to mention that. And I think that the reason we did that too, is that first is provide some great support via uh, ITU to get uh, translation support. So it's not just in English, it's in uh, five other UN languages. And uh, we, we think that's the way to go, you know, cause we're doing this for global product security and response, not for ourselves. I mean, we, we benefit definitely, but you know, if we, if we don't share it, then it's not a lot of use for ourselves by itself. And I think that really goes to the education part too, is that um, a lot of our training materials are, are done initially in English. What we're looking to do is as we build that body, select certain elements and ask for those to also be translated because giving it to the trainers so that they have something to work with is highly important. I remember when we showed the, the PSER framework in its initial uh, draft uh, 1.0 to the board directors, a lot of them said, you know, this is the first time I've seen what you guys do explained. I didn't realize how much I was reliant on what you produce. And as we say that comment to others, we're finding it echoes across the entire ecosystem. So that's the value here. And, and that's really a driver for us to keep going. And that's the reason that we're looking to continue growing our materials and, and make it so others can adapt and use it. And that's why we put it in a, co a creative commons. So it stays open and free for everyone to work there. And of course you'd expect some guy from Red Hat to say that, but we're saying that really from a first perspective, that is the important part from first and, and why we believe this community exists underneath first. When we look at the third party components, um, you know, this is a problem set and, and tooling, both of them are problem sets that we've seen in the PCER community since our first TC eight years ago. Wow, what happened? Well, we thought that the market would allow demand that uh, someone would stand up and build a tool. In, in reality, we've all built our own tools off of other uh, quote platforms. And we're finding that they're, they're just not there. And so with the importance of uh, people talking about software building materials, the third party component stuff becomes very important. The question is, we need to crack that. And, and I know we're discussing some things about what we can open source so people can actually collect what it is that they're manifesting, especially when they start talking about, you know, third party components and directly open source software. So uh, look for that to have some interesting stuff as we move into this next six to 12 months. Uh, I think you're going to see some things there that we're looking to change and upgrade on this entire part. Tooling. Uh, wow. This has been the bane of our existence. Finding something that actually understands and tickets instant response and integrates into engineering. That's a huge challenge. And if you look at the number of different data sets that we have to deal with from CVEs to CVSS to people talking about new things like DWF or, uh, you know, what we're going to do with, uh, with supply chain and SPDX, you know, and I'm talking acronym soup, it sounds like, but the reality is that that's what we live. And we need something that can actually hook all this together because our engineering teams rely on that data set. You know, incident response is the last part of a secure development life cycle. But we have so much information that is very key to keep an ecosystem clear and operating that we feed back in and those items drive engineering problem sets to be resolved. And so we have to find a better tooling and we're coming to the point that now we need to, we need to build our own. Yeah, and I, I would add on those, those last two points, right, on the third party components and tooling, those are probably the most common topics we hear about at the technical colloquium. And, and I think the biggest areas that P-certs are challenged by, how do I manage vulnerabilities that are in my third party components? How do I make sure that I can track that information? And there's, there's and, and how do I uh, then communicate that to my customers, right? There's not, I think, one right answer 
uh, as much as we'd like there to be, but there's a common set of experiences and differences based on the way that companies handle their products and their portfolio that we can share information and come up with guidelines, guardrails, ways that we can address this concern. But again, I think that's an ever-changing target. It changes based on maybe potentially new legislation, new ISO standards, new uh, regulatory requirements, as well as new experiences along the way. So this is a, a growing space. And the tooling is another topic that we hear uh, every year, right? We talk about how the heck can we manage the onslaught of vulnerabilities that get reported in for our products and make sure that they're being managed without uh, as much human glue as we, we tend to use in our industry. So this is, this is a place where we can share a lot of information and potentially as a SIG, help to create some of the solutions, create some common solutions. It's a desire that we have uh, and one that we've heard a lot from the members of the group, so. Thanks, Josh, that's, that's good. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so I'm still picking me anyways. So <laughs> we're, we're talking about what do we do in the future? And, and this is, uh, you know, this is almost a double-edged sword. This is our wish list. It, it, we have to make our wish list uh, consumable, actionable, and, and working through that. So um, we, we're really trying to get the message and, and, and drive the message and inform people. And so we're looking very much that in the 22, 2022 first conference, is that we run a parallel track for P-certs. Uh, it probably won't be full conference. It'll probably be two, maybe two and a half days of just P-cert tracks uh, aimed at P-cert teams so we can actually exchange information, um, but inform people who are looking and seeking because we're finding that there, there's, a, there's a lot of people who go to the conference that are looking for that information and from across the spectrum. So we want to do that and, and be able to advance a common message instead of the spurious uh, comments back and forth that sometimes confuse the message. The second part is uh, we really need a lot more work on our open source tooling process. We're, we're looking to retool what we're doing and what we've found is like anyone else, um, we, the PCERT folks, are operators and operators sometimes don't code very well or they don't code a entire uh, tool very well, they, they do functions and uh, they write something very specific for need instead of a, a design. So the question is, do we go ahead and, and bring some more DevOps type folks from our organizations into that? And um, we're talking actively with some DevOps folks to, to do that and see if we can get a consensus of other, everyone doing that and just open source our own tooling needs. Um, we're speaking with CERCC about their Vince program uh, has a lot of neat, unique features. They've done a lot of heavy lift. Um, Search CC is very much interested in open sourcing that. Uh, but when we look at it from a piece perspective, we have a tendency to look at it as not enterprise ready for us. There are certain things that we need to be able to do and assure. And um, we want to influence that model and, and open source how that works because coordination mechanisms are key to our survival. And PGP emails just don't cut what we need to do nowadays with the volume and the, and the wide array and being able to track where we are. Manifesting an SBOM, um, we see that's on the horizon. It's going to happen somehow in some way at some point, and we're in the middle of it. You know, we, you cannot do vulnerability analysis if you don't know what you have. It's that simple. It's key to our survival. And if we're doing that and we're collecting it, then we're looking at both build and release then that means it's a natural to be part of that entire system. Let's look at how that works. Um, organizational coordination and response. Uh, we've had some uh, folks come to us from a couple different uh, uh, areas and, and speak to us. Uh, in fact, I, I saw something new to this happen on the first list today. Um, how do we do it at an organizational level? You know, answer response is usually like, you know, uh, Pete knows Josh, Pete and Josh talk, we get our team to do something, nice. Okay, was well, this Pete and Josh and we were instant responder? Okay, but how do we do better than that? And so the, what we're looking at right now is how do we do it at an organizational level? Because when you do real full orchestration, 
It's not just the incident response team. Let's face it, incident response teams really don't do. Incident response teams have other people do. And if that's what we're doing, then how do you bring your, your uh, corporate comms, et cetera, together? Josh? Yeah, I just wanted to, to point out. So you're right. I mean, there's, there's multiple layers to this. And we, I mentioned earlier about how we are an ecosystem and we really depend on working with a lot of other groups within the, an, an individual organization. And then it, that gets complicated even further when you're dealing with vulnerabilities that impact multiple vendors and you have the multi-party coordinated vulnerability disclosure and you have researchers that are involved that are external to any one of these companies and have their own motivations and, and needs to uh, around disclosure. So this becomes more and more complicated. And I think there are, um, there, there are a lot of ways to crack this nut, but I think we as an organization, as a piece or industry organization, need to help come up with some strategies for this. Okay. Yeah, the, there's not necessarily a linear straight A to Z answer here. We, we realize that there's a couple different paths and they depend on the situation. The key is, Organization for instant response works best if you know people and you have the same similar method in advance. Learning on the fly is really hard. Working from something you have established and flexing, pretty easy. And that's what we're really looking for. So coordinated vulnerability disclosure then comes into the next question of what do we need to do for these operational approaches? Are we thinking through that? You know, you say co coordinated vulnerability disclosure. We've had so many things about multi-party and bilateral and coordinated and, you know, uh, you, you name the title. The real question is, um, are we looking at it from an operational perspective? We look at it from, quote, a standard of what we do. We look at it, it's a linear thing, but reality is there's a lot of operational complexity that sometimes CBD hasn't accounted for. Do we need to add that? So there's a question. Um, when we say, do we restructure, we're actually talking about the SIG. One of the things that, that Josh and I try to do is um, if, if something is not working fully or we need to change priority is adapt to it. It also goes with where our members are. And so if there's a member set that wants to work something, we're gonna move forward on it. If they're not interested in working on it, well, we'll put it on the sideline that someone else cares, or we have a lot of bandwidth. I don't know about the bandwidth part that we're having, but uh, the care does come around. So that, that's just a matter of how we've worked that. But I think, and, and I want to add to that, Pete, because, uh, you know, we talked earlier about the work groups and how we've structured the work groups. And the piece at SIG over time has evolved. I, I mean, we weren't static for, for seven years and then just implemented the, the work groups. We were constantly ebbing and flowing in how uh, the areas of focus that we had um, our members' interests and members' needs, as well as um, how we approached creating the deliverables that we did. The, the latest iteration of the SIG in creating the working groups was a, to try to create parallel efforts around all the work items and deliverables that we have, and to harness the, the sheer mass of the PCERT SIG and the interest of the PCERT SIG. But we also, once we implemented it, I, I won't say that it went smoothly. We learned some things about the bumps in the road that we hit with the implementation of the working groups, as well as participation in those working groups. And um, maybe realized that we had more bandwidth limitations as a whole, uh, as a community, because of the nature of the work that we do, than we realized uh, when we set this up. And maybe we were a little too aggressive in, in that strategy. We have to think about that. And that's part of what you know Pete's talking about when we say, do we restructure? This is something that it, it's not, the it's it's not just for Pete and Josh to to decide, but it's a collaborative discussion that will happen and needs to happen within the SIG to figure out what's the best strategy for moving forward. I think Sorry. the key, key, key part Josh and I are trying to point there is that we're very tuned to our members because there are they're the cohorts in working this, they're friends, and we're cognizant of hey, listen. We have lives and, you know, other world things have happened and, and uh, what is our priority and, and, and things have been busy or it seems to get busier, busier, uh, however you want to look at it. And so we're, we're accounting for that and flexing for it. And so that's where we look at the, the mo momentum and participation. Uh, we can always use more people. Um, you know, many hands makes a light load. So we're looking for that. And then part of what we realize is that 
our greatest success has been that we have met a couple times per year. And while the, the conference hasn't been like, we all get together and we have a formal meeting, we're a lot less formal, but we meet over multiple days and we talk through, you know, a lot of work group stuff. The TC allowed us to get together specifically as P-certs because it's almost exclusively P-certs. And when we look at that, we actually were able to do work before we meet. And so we've already had an agenda. We've done a lot of work. Now we're getting down to, and we find that in the day that we do prior, we actually did like um, four months where the meetings work in one day because we're able to concentrate and work through that. So that's what we're looking for. And we're trying to look at a TC possibly September, October timeframe. And if we can make that work, uh, that'll be great. So that's what we're looking for there and uh, uh, our future thoughts. So the, the real key is um, uh, if, if you've got an organization that does uh, writing and distributing apps, oh, we could use your input. We could use your guidance. Uh, you, you give us a pointer. If you know something that works already, we'll be glad. If you're putting code together and you're putting it out for customers, you probably got a reason to come talk to us. That's just, it, it's a fact of life. If you're working on uh, uh, and crossing into doing piece type things, hey, come ask questions, come learn. More importantly, tell us things that we don't know because all that is important. And if you're doing great, hey, share what you got. We like that because it's interesting when we have all of a sudden somebody say, well, I got a problem. And it's like those conversations stop for 15 minutes. Yeah, we're still talking. But now we're talking about the real problem right in front of us. And it's amazing the number of times you'll hear th three, four uh, different individuals representing different organizations talk about the same problem, not knowing the others are deep in it too. And sharing, that has helped. Um, so if you're a member of a PCER, we ask, come join us. Contribute to the group and we'll work for, with you. I'm <laughs> glad to have you on board. Josh. Yeah, I want to add to this, right? That um, and, and Pete alluded to this much earlier. You know, the 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 essence of our SIG is the community, and we all work together to collaborate on. I think to to share the challenges we face and to work together to solve the problems that that we have in front of us. This is an opportunity to be a part of a a, a SIG that. Um, that needs your help in any capacity. Don't ever look at this and say, well, you know, I'm not, I'm new to PCERT or I don't know a whole lot about PCERT. There's a lot of ways that you can still help, even if you're learning along the way. We need help with the operations of the, of the PCERT SIG. We need help with the organization of the PCERT SIG. We need help with uh, reviewing documents, creating documents, creating content. Um, there's, there's so many little parts to running a SIG that we could use your help with. And I guarantee you, a lot of you listening have expertise in spaces that you can contribute to this SIG. Um, and we welcome you, right? If you're a member of a PCERT and you want to help in some way, if even whether you're new or more mature, come talk to us because I think there's opportunities for you to come and help and uh, give back to the greater community. New people are especially important because you're going to read the document and you're going to ask us, that doesn't make sense to me. What are you trying to say? And that is probably the most valuable input we get. Right. Sean, do we have any questions? Um, we do have one question here. Um, so for, for folks who are kind of new coming into SIG work or, or new to FIRST, one of the questions is, you know, how much information do I have to share? You know, it's, we, we talk a lot about, you know, sharing practices and things of that nature. Um, what other kind of information gets shared in, in the meeting? So, you know, if my company is concerned about that, I'm going to go and be talking to the, uh, you know, the person over at Red Hat, um, how do I, uh, you know, put their fears to rest? I think the first thing is come and just listen. You don't have to share anything. Right. Okay. Um, and we certainly aren't asking anyone to share about an ongoing incident. Uh, if you feel like, you know, sharing later, you know, about a past incident and, and, and uh, 
anonymizing some of the details, uh, wh whether it's the players or the actual uh, uh, incident problem challenge, you know, code, you can do that. More importantly, really isn't the incident. It's what you learned out of the incident. It's the, what did you learn that we should be looking at doing as a practice? That's the bigger part that we're looking for. Right. Think about the, uh, you know, the operational nature of the work that you do. Um, a lot of times that falls outside of your company's, what your company would consider to be sensitive information. Um, but, but to Pete's point, right, start by coming and just listening. You can spend some time just hearing the kind of information that gets shared without sharing anything at all. And then um, networking, building relationships. To be quite honest, that's probably the biggest value that anybody gets out of the PCERT SIG is building relationships with other companies so that you can have a trust model uh, or develop a circle of trust where you can have deeper conversations. I can't tell you how many times the relationships I have in this SIG have benefited the company I work for because I have a trust relationship with somebody else, even that somebody that's sitting on this panel now, right? So it, you can start off with baby steps and work your way up as you become more comfortable. Excellent answer, excellent answer. Um, a, another question that's uh, from a new person is, um, you know, you, you talk a lot about the, the, the meetings you have and the face-to-face -face and how incredibly important that is. Uh, uh, some of the new SIGs, are, uh, sorry, some of the new folks or new to PCERT may not be able to travel. You know, they, their, their company hasn't seen the, the value of sending someone to a TC or to, you know, an international uh, uh, first meeting. Would you tell them that it's still worthwhile coming into the, to the virtual meetings and contributing that way? Absolutely. I think any way that you can get there and again, build that relationship and get exposed to this is worthwhile. Uh, it, is there, uh, you know, in, in all the years that we've run the TC, uh, the hallway track has been probably the most valuable track, being able to, to have one-off conversations or, you know, we all go out for drinks or have for dinner together. Uh, that's, that's invaluable. However, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dismiss the opportunity to hear information and even start to cord or collaborate virtually if that's the only mechanism that you have available to you. Josh, Josh actually, um, last year uh, was our, our biggest guinea pig for yeah. the virtual part of the, of the, you know, his company wouldn't let them travel um, probably <laughs> the earliest. And, and so he was there virtual. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Josh? Yeah, right. It was, it was literally, um, less than a week before this, the, the TC was going to happen when my company had locked us to our travel down. So we scrambled and we, we decided, and this is with the help of the, the host of the TC, it was NetApp, um, and, and what Pete did on, on the ground in Raleigh, North Carolina, where we had the TC, to create a way to adapt, because I had a lot of people from my team that were going to go. Uh, and we saw the attendance actually explode, because more people were willing to were able to participate because it was a virtual event. So, I, and I, I gotta say, I didn't lose anything from it. In fact, I was, I was on the other end taking notes along with a bunch of other people that were both in the room and virtual. We were all taking notes together to collaborate. And so we had chats going on in Keybase. We had note taking going on in our Google drive and we had people presenting and we could, we could be a part of the Q and A through the screen. So no, I, did, I, I gotta say it was a great experience. Do I prefer to be in person? Absolutely. And if I get the opportunity this year to do it, I would be, but otherwise I wouldn't, I wouldn't not go or not attend or not participate because it's my only mechanism is virtual. And, and, and the interesting part was not only did we explode with people online, we still ended up filling the allotted space. That's right. And we, yeah. We were one below the maximum capacity of the room. And, you know, I, I think we had almost 100 people in the room, to be honest with you. And, and then we had, I don't know how many people was online, but it was several dozens. And it was like, wow. I, and, and Josh and I were just, <laughs> dude, we couldn't have planned this. <laughs> I think that was the exact quote that I heard from, from Josh. It, was, it, it, it exploded. It was a very good experience. Um, and, and Josh, right, yeah. In person is is a totally different thing, but I tell you what, attend the the uh, 
the virtual session and, and help with the note taking and take that to your boss and show the value of what was going on and say, hey, listen, if I was there, the hallway track I hear is even better. I think I just, I have to reiterate because North Carolina was my last uh, voyage out uh, and I, I really appreciated the opportunity to go. Um, and I will say that uh, the hall traffic uh, that actually came in very uh, handy and very, uh, very important today uh, uh, for things I was working on at that point. And uh, it, it was an incredible experience and, and it, you're right, it's just, you get so much more when you can for, can present that way. Um, pardon, let's see. I think we have one other question. Um, I think we'll, we'll grab this one last one here, if you don't mind. Uh, we have a company who is getting ready to launch some really cool products, and they want to have their P13 do a trial run. Any advice on what to cover? So a new product coming out. P13's warming up. I, I guess the, the the product that they got coming out is incident response related or you want them to test it? That's the, the big question because we, we, we do both, but differently. I, I think what they're talking to is that the, yeah. the, the, the P13 process is new and there's a product coming out. So how will the P13 support that product? Um, as they're going I, out? What yeah, my suggestion would be is um, you could do an informal tabletop exercise uh, but doing one that is uh, professionally run would be even better, right? Hire a, a, a legal firm that specializes in running these kinds of tabletop exercises. And you can, you can really see all the kinks uh, and work out all the kinks in your process by doing that. Uh, it's, it should be seen as a learning experience, right? But even if you, if you don't want to, if you can't afford it, or if you don't, you know, you don't want to go down that route, the complexities of that, you can always sit down and, game out what would it be like if we got these kind of vulnerabilities how would we you know how would we respond and play it out like it's a real vulnerability that you had reported by an external researcher that wants to disclose in a certain period of time or at a certain conference put pressures and stresses on the system you know in this imaginary scenario and test it out see what happens right Ma'am, there's the the other part of that is uh, the practical side is uh, it's a new product, so your piece wants to get familiar with it anyways. And do you have a response process alone on that product? Do you know what's in that product? Do you know who to talk to? Those are all the onboarding things, and, and they sound simple, but they actually lead to what Josh is talking about, being able to say, well, here's our instant response process. And then you can go into all the rest of it. So there, there's, there's a lot of different things there to, to cover in that one. Yeah, and I might even back up and say, you know, the tabletop exercise is definitely something I, you know, I would I recommend doing. But if you want to do something even before that, take the processes that you've documented. And if you don't have those, I encourage you to document your processes. Take your processes that you've documented from the intake of a vulnerability to the disclosure of the vulnerability. Walk then walk your engineering team through, walk the other stakeholders in your ecosystem through this to see if they understand what you wrote down, to see if there are any kinks in that. And then take it to some outside entities or stakeholders, maybe a customer or two that you think are a big customer, because ultimately your customer's question is, how do you inform me of security vulnerabilities in your product, right? And that is, gives you a way to, to test how well you can communicate it and how well it would be understood. And I guarantee you, you will find areas that you thought you um, you had well-documented and you didn't. Excellent. Well, we are at the top of the hour. Gentlemen, thank you so much for the update today. Lots of exciting things going on in the Peace Cert SIG and appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. For those just joining us, we're going to take a short break until five after the hour, and then we will get started with the malware analysis SIG update. So stay tuned and we'll be right back.
For those of you just joining us, we will be getting started here in about two minutes. Thank you. All right, it is five after the hour. Welcome back. Uh, our next SIG is the malware analysis SIG. Uh, Andres and Oliver is going to, are going to speak uh, to what they've been working on. Uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screen and I will be asking the gentleman your questions. With that gentleman, please take it away. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I'm uh, Olivier Kalef, and uh, with, along with uh, Andreas, uh, we'll be presenting you uh, who we are in this uh, malware analysis SIG, uh, what we've been working on, and what our plans are. So, uh, the context of uh, this, uh, this SIG is that uh, there has been many chair rotations over the last years, uh, as you can see, uh, since uh, last October, both Andras and myself uh, have been uh, chairing this uh, uh, SIG. Um, unfortunately, as you all guess, uh, we have been having a lot of uh, issues and we've all been very busy with the uh, pandemics. Uh, so unfortunately, a lot of things didn't go as expected uh, compared to what we said last year. So, however, the way we work and uh, how we try to achieve our goals is to have some regular meetings. So we have uh, bi-weekly meetings every other Friday at 6 p.m. CET, uh, noon uh, EDT. Uh, these regular meetings, we just discuss about uh, what's going on, the, the various uh, projects uh, we have. And uh, since uh, the beginning of uh, April, we started a, a new uh, type of meetings. Uh, which is just brainstorming meetings for the moment, but we've been focusing on new project, which is a malware analysis framework, but we're going to discuss about that. So these other types of meeting is also uh, bi-weekly meetings every other Fridays uh, on 1 p.m. CET or 7 a.m. Uh, EDT. Uh, regarding the attendance of these meetings, uh, that's around three to four participants to each uh, meeting, which is uh, not a lot, but... Uh, uh, we do achieve uh, quite a lot of interesting things. And of course, one of our expectations out of this uh, yearly uh, update is to uh, gather more interested people. 
Regarding the tooling, well, we use the, the standard uh, tools that are uh, set in place by the first organization, uh, the mailing list, the amnesia portal, and of course the check the Slack channel. Regarding the projects, um, we two years ago we had a project around the AOCs, the IOCs. So we didn't do a lot on, on this one. Uh, we rather focused on two other topics. The first one was the update of the first web page regarding the tools, and this should be uh, updated uh, soon. And the same thing applies on the malware tool overview. We've been working on this uh, on our internal uh, wiki on the portal uh, in order to uh, make some definitions and some details on the most interesting tools that were used by the community. And this should be uh, put uh, to the public uh, viewers in, uh, in, a few, uh, in a few weeks. The big news and the big project we've been launching recently is the malware analysis framework, uh, which is uh, one month old, and we're going to be detailing uh, this in a few minutes. Andres? Yes, so regarding the malware tools overview, uh, we had a lot of discussions and uh, our main goal is to reuse what's already available. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel. For example, there was a discussion if first should uh, provide an analysis, analysis virtual machine. But then we decided, no, it's too much work to compete with ex existing projects. So it does uh, make sense to just link to these projects and, and try to support them or try to uh, get more attention to these projects and tell our members how they can use these, these VMs, for example, to work uh, on their everyday tasks. The same uh, regarding trainings. Uh, a lot of trainings are available for free, for example, in YouTube. So we don't want to create new training courses, but we want to link to them and give uh, interested people a good introduction, which, which training they should follow to get into the field of uh, malware, malware analysis. Uh, in general, we want to present a starting point to anyone who is willing to start in the field. So we want to help them. We want to guide them in the first uh, on their first steps we, we want to present some guidelines to to support their learning process and we try to initiate discussions within the first community about malware uh, related topics and this over tools overview was updated in the last year and it will be updated soon as uh, olivier already mentioned then uh, next slide please Olivier, can you change the slide? Or have we lost him? Olivier, are you back? OK. So the malware analysis framework, that's the new uh, big project we're working on. So uh, we started discussing what are the reasons for tracking some malware. Uh, might it be activity-based, uh, sec activity sector-based activity? Consistencies uh, need some different, uh, different input. Uh, then we have a lot of inputs from feed, feed potential impacts on your environment. And this led to the decision that we want to create a kind of a malware analysis framework for first to guide people through the through the process. So what are best practices on, um, on malware analysis and response? And currently we're discussing about uh, three phases. So the first phase would be would be the I'll just try to take over the screen sharing. So the first phase uh, is concentrating on the preparations or the triage process, which uh, samples are, are worth spending more time on it. Uh, prioritization, which samples are extremely urgent because for example, the SOC asked, asked us for some recommendations, how to detect 
to block a specific malware which might have already entered our environment, then uh, which strategy, strategy or playbook should be used to do the to analyze analyze the sample and so on. Then phase two will be concentrating uh, on the on the actual process itself. So that's uh, where we are going to start uh, discussing the next time. And then the phase three would be the post analysis also on uh, good practices. How can we share or at minimum uh, some, some information with interested peers that they can uh, detect uh, the same sample in their environment as well. And then I'm heading back to Olivier. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry for the uh, for the issue. I had a drop of connectivity. Uh, so, what are our plans for the uh, for the coming year? Uh, two things uh, here. Um, or I would say the first one and the most important one is to increase the number of active participants. Uh, here, you have an opportunity to join a SIG who's who nearly needs help. Uh, we've been focusing and we've been working on quite a lot of uh, topics, uh, but we need fresh ideas. So I'm sure that a lot of you have uh, real expertise and uh, years of, uh, of activities in this uh, field, in the malware analysis field, which is something quite commonly found into the, uh, the C-Search community. Uh, so come on and join us and uh, you'll have an opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to share ideas, to, uh, to uh, um, go forward in, uh, in a good direction, uh, which is uh, promoting our, our activities uh, pr promoting the, the topic and uh, having your knowledge shared with uh, many others in this uh, in this community. The second uh, idea is to publish all the deliverables we've been working over the last uh, year and a half and uh, and all the updates. And finally, uh, and that's uh, one of the uh, latest uh, uh, element that has been just presented by Andres, uh, working and joining the Malware Analysis Framework Initiative. Uh, here, once again, the idea is not that much to focus on uh, uh, technical matters, but really to focus on the methodology and helping newbies or helping uh, newcomers to this uh, field to get some uh, good directions, good guidelines, and uh, even uh, be able to improve this, uh, this framework. So that's why we are all very eager to, to see you join us in this uh, uh, SIG and um, have new faces, have new ideas, and uh, being able to bring more um, inputs to these uh, projects and including this, uh, this framework. So that's all for me, all for today. Uh, we open for uh, questions. Sean, if you've got some. Excellent, excellent. So um, I, I was noticing your uh, uh, slides, it said uh, TLP Amber, but I'm, the information obviously that we're sharing in this, uh, in this venue is, is okay. Um, one of the questions that has come up is, um, do uh, volunteers need to be a member of FIRST to join? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes. Do um, do uh, mem members who come in to volunteer for your SIG do they need to be a member of First Proper to come to come join, or can you take people who are not no, members I'd... of First? Okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. No, I'd say that it's uh, open uh, like uh, many other SIGs. Uh, so uh, we are quite open to uh, uh, anyone who's been in this community, uh, not specifically the first community, but I would say the malware analysis uh, community. And this is, uh, I would say, a much wider audience. And once again, uh, wider opportunities to uh, to meet with uh, new ideas and, and also different types of experience. And it, it sounded like from what you said, you're looking for volunteers who are both, you know, very, very tenured in the field, but it sounds like you're also open to, to members who are new to malware analysis who are having to like start up their own malware analysis and, and things of that nature. Is that correct? Andres? Uh, yes, absolutely. Because everyone has to learn, uh, has to start learning. And even if you're a newbie to the, to the field, you can uh, just by 
asking the correct questions, you can uh, give some directions or, or some input how the framework, for example, should be built and, and what would be helpful for such uh, new members into, in, into the field. Terrific. Uh, and is the framework open to non-first members? I think we answer to this one, which is another answer is yes, of course. Uh, once again, uh, all members of this uh, SIG uh, will have the opportunity to uh, uh, to join and to to bring their own uh, knowledge and expertise. So uh, yeah, definitely yes, we are open to uh, uh, to anyone in this uh, in this uh, I would say subgroup in this uh, malware analysis framework. Oh, I, I, my apology. I believe the question is more is that the uh, collateral that you all are producing will that be public then for for anyone or for members of first or how will that work? Um, I think if uh, when we have something that that is worth publishing it, then then it will be open to, to anyone. Like the previous group said, the uh, previous six said, yeah, it should be Creative Commons because everyone is participating and first doesn't have the or shouldn't have the only right to access it. Because what we want to create is is for for everyone who's out there who and who is uh, working in in the field of malware analysis. Terrific, terrific. And obviously, if anyone has interest, they can reach out directly to you all or to the first secretary uh, to, or, or to me uh, to, to get connected and, and join up. And uh, uh, there's a lot of great work happening there. And uh, I can't wait to see, see what you all accomplish in the next year. So thank you, gentlemen, very much. I appreciate your time today. Uh, next up, we are going to start in, a, at, uh, in five minutes. Oh, actually. We are right at time. Let me see. We do have our folks ready. So let's go ahead and uh, we will come back in five minutes, uh, give everyone a chance to kind of get settled in. And so we will start at uh, 25 after the hour and we will be with you shortly. Thank you very much.
For anyone who's just joining us, we'll be getting started here in about three minutes. Thank you. All righty, we'll kind of start uh, revving up here for the uh, next SIG, the Passive DNS Exchange Group. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're getting updates from all the wonderful SIG work that's happening across FIRST, and I'm very interested to see what the uh, Passive DNS Exchange folks have been up to today. We have uh, Alexandra and Aaron, uh, Aaron excuse me, uh, coming to us live today. Uh, so if we can get your slides up and going, uh, and for those who have joined, we are uh, going to be utilizing the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screen. Just uh, pop your question in there, and if we have time at the end, I will be asking the gents to comment and answer your questions. And with that, we will get going. Please take it away. Okay. You can see my, see my screen, I assume, right? You're in, all, you're in good shape. Perfect. Okay, good. So um, thanks for having us here. And um, yeah, thanks for the, the opportunity for an update and also the opportunity for, you know, having regular reminders for the sake to do something, <laughs> which is the other aspect of it. So but we do have some nice updates, actually. Um, so a quick recap. So I'm, we're, we're going to talk about that. And Alex, uh, please join me at any moment, of course, as you wish, you know, the usual shimafu, yeah. So um, Quick history recap, what this is about, the status quo, where we are right now, the differences to the current um, version of the standard. And then we have some pretty exciting news for you. Uh, last weekend, um, I was able to, uh, with uh, Farset and Circle together, to um, uh, contribute a common output format import module for MISP. So in other words, we can use our standards to actually feed that stuff into MISP and do the correlation magic in MISP, which is fantastic. OK, so history. Um, uh, passive DNS was invented sort of in the first context, first at org context. So in uh, by BFK in 2005, it was presented at first for the first time. I think as far as I know worldwide, there might be other some agencies who, who had invented it before, but they didn't speak about it publicly. So, um, and then, you know, the, a couple of people started to implement passive DNS servers. So Circa, Alexander, me back then at 30 t uh, Paul Vixie back then at I ISC. Um, and of course, BFK. So um, we quickly got, got access to each other's passive DNS systems and it was uh, always getting the data. And then the idea came pretty soon to have a common output format from the service so that we can merge the different uh, results because every service sees sort of with its sensors only parts of the global DNS uh, globally. Yeah? So we ended up with uh, writing a standard here uh, within first. and. Um, yeah, and we ended up more or less on standardizing Farsight's output, um, uh, which is a JSON format. So next, yeah. Um, how does that look, the JSON format? A minimal set of mandatory fields and a minimal set of optional fields. And then we have a, a registry mechanism, basically a GitHub page, um, where you can uh, propose new ones and eventually they make it into the standard. 
simple, easy JSON format, actually, actually JSON ND, so JSON line, backslash N, JSON line, et cetera. Yeah? Um, that's how it looks. You have the RR name, that's basically the domain name, the record type A, and then the R data, the record data, um, uh, resource data, uh, which would be the IP address in the case of RR type A. And then the important info is like, when was this tuple above seen the first time? And when was it seen the last time? And how many authoritative answers did it see? And where we got it from basically, yeah? So this is uh, sort of really in a nutshell the format, most, mostly, yeah? Uh, we're currently at version eight of the draft, which was submitted just recently. Um, thank you, Alexander. And uh, we incorporated the feedback from the SIG. This process is slow, but you know, it continues and thorough. And we officially requested a go from the uh, SIG working group to um, continue at the IATF and then put it into the DNS ops working group um, uh, as a standard. Uh, in the standards track. Yeah? Um, we, I, I basically said silence procedure until the 19th of May, in case nobody objects until then, we'll proceed from that. Okay. Now, Alex, do you want to talk about that next part? Can I hand over for you to you? Yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, we, we had this, this discussion and I think this one is, is important, the history behind is quite important because at, at, at first, um, we are, I think, all the third uh, using different tool sets uh, for analyzing uh, passive DNS data and so on. And uh, one of the tools, obviously, that we are maintaining and, and, and supporting is MISP, and a lot of people are using it for doing uh, trade intelligence, uh, uh, investigations, uh, analysis, and so on. And when we were discussing with Aaron, we were like, okay, yeah, but maybe we are missing a, a module for importing exactly the data coming from any passive DNS implementation, like the Farsight one or any others. And uh, Aaron took uh, the liberty to make a module, which is super great, because this one is allowing to import uh, COF uh, input into MISP. So in MISP, there is a, a standard uh, model of importing data, uh, which is uh, called MISP modules. So it's an easy way to extend MISP with a uh, Python code. Uh, and then this module is uh, basically importing a JSON file and creating the associated object in, uh, in, in MISP. So that, that means you can uh, have the correlations, you can uh, add this in the event, you can create relationship between the object, you can tell a story. And that's, I think, one of the most important aspects when you, you do passive DNS analysis. You want at some point to, to explain what kind of data you have in front of you. It's not only the raw data, but it's really, okay, why do we have such record? Uh, for a classical example. So for example, you have an attack on a, on, on, on a, on a, on a registrar, and this registrar get compromised, one account got compromised, and you want to see the, the full timeline with the history and so on. And that's, with this module, you can directly see it because you see the, the timeline and so on with all the different uh, set of records, when they appear, when they disappear, when they stop to be used and so on. And as passive DNS is, is providing a kind of continuous way of, of seeing all DNS records are used, you directly see it and it's really helping you in your investigations. Um, this module is, is part of the standard module set of, of MISP as an import module. Uh, in addition to that, we have an expansion module too. Uh, so that means you can even do a live query on a MISP data set on record uh, against any passive DNS implementation. So uh, if you are curious, if you are already using MISP, you just update your MISP module, so you will get uh, the COF module uh, uh, there, and you just need to enable it on your MISP instance in the uh, generic configurations on the plugins and as this uh, COF module activated and then you can import the data directly into your uh, uh, MISP instance. But it's very interesting because you can get the data in, start to do the correlation, you can even pivot back and forth. That's interesting because sometimes you want to get the data in because you have a kind of first idea of your investigation and then if you want to refine a different type of investigation and so on, you can just pivot again on specific records that that you get from the first output and so on, and, and expand this uh, um, data. If it's okay, I can show a live demo. Perfect. I think we have time. Yeah, okay, good. Let me see if I can switch to my monitor. Yes, okay, all right. Um, do, 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 do. Can you see the screen perfect. of MISP? Yeah, perfect. Okay, is it is it too small, the font? I can make it a little bit bigger, maybe? A bit bigger, yeah. All right, yeah, okay. So, all right, so uh, basically, um, we, 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 in MISP, we create an event, which is sort of the container for all the 
IOCs or attributes. Um, I'll give it some description, tests, cough for first. Yeah, oops, all caps, sorry. Um, and yes, this is just a demo MISP instance. So I have an event and the event basically has, a, here would be the attributes, which I would often call IOCs, but anyone, you, you know, call it whatever you like. And, um, and in MISP they're called attributes. So we do here populate from, and I have an import module here, cov to MISP. And I just upload the JSON output file. In that case, it was, okay, I don't have to probably, Okay, can can show it to you, but this is in the format that we showed, yeah. Um, and I'll import it, and this is a two-stage two process. So first, here it will give me the uh, import results, so the preview of how what would be imported into MISP, yeah. So number of resolved attributes that it found, and each one here, this blue box is a MISP object, as Alex explained. Um, and it has uh, basically the data in here that we have in the format. You see our name, that's the domain name. There's a record and our data is the IP address. And then again, in raw format, the first time it was seen, parsed in human readable format and how often. That is exactly the format that we defined at first. There is uh, another field here that I didn't show you before, but who cares? It is not, not re relevant for the idea. Um, and then, you know, I imported all of the, those and I'll say submit. I'm happy with it. Or I could say, okay, I don't want this one, for example. I am not interested. Oh, okay, I'll actually leave that because that's a cool one. Okay, um, import. Bum, 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 bum. Um, it says, please wait a little bit. Okay, I'll just reload that page. It should be finished. And it's finished. And by the way, now we have immediately the correlation uh of misp happening so this is interesting here this this something correlates with an event about a mirai attack home routers thing from 2016 so we can check what is the correlation here we see here the related events hang on which event was that if i hover over it it's 77606 at the bottom of the screen i saw that link so uh we see seven seven so I'll search for 77606. So, okay, well, this IP address correlates with some other event. Okay, this is an internal address, so maybe not that interesting. But um, how about asking here, like as Alex explained, like the um, uh, in a pivot back and forth, uh, um, ask me uh, passive DNS again, what other records do you have about this one? Yeah. So it takes a little bit of time. It has some records it would show it and we could actually also import the other ones by doing usually here, yeah? Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, you can- Maybe yeah, there's something interesting to show. Uh, you can yes. show the event timeline. Um, yes, yes, to, yes. To, to show the evolution of the day. So the thing, what is the advantage of using COF in this case? Imagine that you do a query on, I don't know, Circle, Certainty, Kas uh, Kaspersky uh, output, or even the, uh, the one from Farsight, then you can import all of those and those have the same format and then you can benefit from the correlation. So even if you have multiple data source uh, and that was really the goal of the uh, of the SIG, the SIG was to, to have a common format and that's, I think I think we reached that goal at the end for, for the SIG. Yeah. If no, we have a, a complete format uh, there. I somehow don't see it. I don't know why. It's, it's a demo effect, it looks like. <laughs> okay. I did actually screenshots before, yeah. But okay, okay. I didn't no, do a it's... screenshot of, of this first in last scene, yeah. yeah that, that's correct. Yeah. Should, I don't should know be why. fine, yeah. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Maybe, maybe uh, you have a blocker or a popper or something that maybe, blocks. Yeah, no, I'm not, not blocking anything here. Okay. okay. Anyway, so yeah, we have like event graphs, our events are connected. We do, can do all the, the magic of MISP, uh, the correlations. Uh, so come on, go away. Okay, <laughs> demo effect, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, more of that is coming. So in the pipeline of that is um, uh, correlations between objects as mentioned before and uh, all of other nice things. So, so we can basically operationalize the, uh, the thing that we did here in the first SIG. There's yeah. something uh, in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe something that we, we want to work on is, is basically to, to extract more meta information from the raw cost data. Because the raw cost yes. data is really the raw data. And mm -hmm. the thing that we are working on is, for example, the extraction of the DKIM aspect, uh, mm -hmm. SOA record, 
or, uh, for example, the fingerprint record used for SSH mm -hmm. and so on. So the, the idea is really to expand it. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, maybe the next step for the SIC, uh, now that we have like the cough format is really going in the standard track. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we, we might expect an RFC maybe soon uh, for this uh, document. So that means the next step for the SIC might be more on uh, what kind of metadata, what kind of thing that you can extract from the raw data in cough format. Mm -hmm. And then uh, maybe the query aspect, or you will query in the future the data set and how you exchange information about uh, the query themselves. Because the thing that in NIST, sometimes people are not only sharing the results, but we would like to share uh, how you reach that uh, result. And that's the thing that we are working to uh, uh, with different, uh, different organizations is to be able to describe what an analyst did on the uh, uh, passive DNS uh, queries and so on to find out Uh, what they uh, what they found uh, during their investigation and share this kind of, of analysis so like that everyone can uh, reproduce it. Mm. Yeah, there's there's really lots of ideas here, uh, here and this is this is really a very cool thing because like now sort of you know passive DNS. Uh, one idea that 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 I had was um, you know since we have that implemented now and since first has a MISP instance. Um, we could ask like if, uh, you know, you want to connect uh, with the MISP instance to some passive DNS systems uh, so that the, all the first members could basically use it and also, um, you know, do, do some analysis there or at least play around with it. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's an idea to be discussed. And anyway, I think we have a little bit of time of questions maybe, or unless Alex, you still have any? No, it's fine. I mean, if you have any okay. questions, it's the time. Yeah. yeah, good. Okay, excellent. Wow. First of all, congrats, gentlemen, doing a live demo on an international uh, call. I'm, <laughs> I'm super impressed. You braved it. Well done. Uh, you did not blue screen of death, even better. Uh, so just a reminder, anyone, if you have questions, please pop them in the Q&A and I will, uh, I will gladly uh, pass them along here. Uh, a couple of questions that I do have. Um, What kind of volunteers are you all looking for? Do people need to be members of FIRST to participate? Are you looking for folks who are already kind of educated in passive DNS or what, what are you looking for with, with help? I guess it's 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 open to anyone. Uh, I mean, this you're touching on an interesting topic because uh, actually um, back then I don't know when when was that 2010, 11 or something. Gavin Reed asked me like, hey, do you want to bring that passive DNS stuff into first? And I was like, yeah, sure, why why not? I mean, but actually it was really the implementers talking amongst the, amongst each other what would make sense. So it's like that's you know the implementers of passive DNS servers. Yeah. So um, the first SIG opened that up a little bit to to other implementers of passive DNS servers. Um, uh, and uh, Peter, I'll ask, answer that in a second. And that was, was mostly the discussion. Uh, however, of course, if you're a user of passive DNS, I think that's a really valuable feedback as well. So, so you know, if you want to join the SIG, here's the mailing list yeah, um, for, for ask, ask for first sec for a uh, subscription. Um, then, um, you know, if you just have user feedback, that's also valuable. Yeah, But at the end of the day, it, it needs to be useful, right? So. Yeah, I hope yeah, I yeah uh, especially for, for uh, use cases. I mean, if you have analysts that are using passive DNS on a day to day basis for doing their investigations, we are really interested in feedback about things that are missing. Because uh, we, we have kind of history with passive DNS, so we have kind of, of way of doing it. But maybe there are other options to, uh, to investigate. And I think having more diversity uh, on, on the analyst side, use case, and so on are, are people that are really welcome in the SIC. Uh, to get to gather that and i mean it's open to first member but it's open to uh, any member of the community so it's not only first internal but it's really uh, open to to everyone yeah so peter's question uh yes of course uh so um sai europe uh, uh paul vix is heavily involved with that also uh bfk uh, uh christoph fischer uh, who whose company did the first passive DNS server worldwide, as far as I know. So, um, yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> Hope that answers one, it. one last question. When are your meetings? 
is rather ad hoc. So, you know, the, the, the mailing list was rather quiet uh, and dormant um, because it was morally, mostly really, you know, implementers of passive DNS service discussing amongst each other. We could be more active on the mailing list, of course, or CC it uh, if, if there is some, but it's often, it's <laughs> to be honest, it's a nice reminder from first that we should do something. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so the sick uh, liaisons, etc. Yeah, um, and um, you know this has been in the making for a long time. So um, it's out there; it's uh, searchable. People have found it. We have we know that really many passive DNS servers implemented that standard. So 360CN, a uh, couple really the, the large ones actually all know it. Yeah, uh, domain tools, all these uh, folks know it. I think even virus taught them. Um, so um, yeah, I, I mean, it it is there. And so we've been getting feedback mostly on GitHub, actually on the GitHub issues. <clears throat> yeah, it's many, many, many GitHub nowadays. Um, so we, we are not so used to making physical meetings for this uh, video call uh, because we, we, it's, it's more like we were used to the standard track of the IOTF and, and, and basically having all those process uh, of, of creating issues, uh, getting the document, uh, sharing that information through GitHub. Um, so that's why we don't have that much, uh, I would say, uh, video meetings or VTC. Um, but if we see, for example, an interest of having uh, regular meetings about use cases, uh, and, and things like that, I think uh, uh, we, we, can, we can do it. Uh, so if you have any members of FIRST that are willing to make a, a specific session regarding passive DNS or even a workshop how to use passive DNS and go more uh, deep dive into the use of, of, of the passive DNS, uh, we'd be uh, more than happy to, to, to do such kind of, of session. I, I can agree with Alex here. I think that the next really interesting step is sort of uh, how to share queries and stories that we find in Passive DNS because it's such a massively useful tool. Um, but the, the sharing of the stories, that would be really cool. So users now would be really nice. I mean, yes, the standard works. Uh, we can we can ask a techno designer first to the board if, if they want to have it in the misp.first.org instance. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, gentlemen, yeah. we, we came right up to perfect timing. Thank you all so much for your presentation today. This is awesome work and uh, can't wait to see what uh, what comes next. Um, Great, thank you. Thank you very much for the organization. Absolutely. Thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would okay. like to thank everyone who's been in attendance here at our open reports. Uh, we do have a uh, closed report uh, that required pre-registration for the consumer packaged goods. Uh, if you are joining us for that, please find your Zoom email with the uh, new link that you'll need to attend that meeting. For the rest of you, thank you so much for joining us today. Hope you found this useful. Uh, please come get involved. Uh, there's a lot of great work coming in. And as you've heard from each of the SIGs, they are all looking for volunteers. So thank you for your time. We will start at uh, 50 past the hour, so in about five minutes on the other channel for the free registrators. Thank you.